undoubtedly one of the greatest triumphs of modern day clinical neurophysiology has been the ability to study neuromuscular junction transmission in vivo. There are a number of approaches we can take to do this. There's a macroscopic approach when we're looking at the neuromuscular junctions of possibly hundreds of muscle fibers using repetitive nerve stimulation to do this. And we can look at the individual muscle fiber activations using single fiber EMG techniques. In the healthy situation, nerves transmit signals to muscles using acetylcholine. An electrical impulse will be propagated across an axon. It will cause depolarization of voltage-gated calcium channels and calcium will influx into the terminal bouton of the axon. Through a series of complex steps, acetylcholine quanta stored near the presynaptic junction will be then be released and diffuse across the synaptic cleft to hit the motor end plate. At the motor end plate, there is an accumulation of acetylcholine receptors. These depolarize, sodium floods in to the motor end plate region and causes an end plate potential. If this is sufficient, it will cause the muscle membrane to depolarize and contract. Acetylcholine in that synaptic cleft will then be degraded by acetylcholine esterase. The choline is reabsorbed, taken back up into vesicles and reused. Within the bouton, there are a number of stores of acetylcholine quanta. There's a primary store next to the presynaptic membrane, and there's a secondary store behind this, which will replenish the primary store when it is depleted. A much larger tertiary store exists within the cell body and the axon of the motor nerves, and this is used much later on. Defects of acetylcholine transmission can occur at any point and may be congenital or acquired. The most important of the acquired causes is myasthenia gravis, where antibodies form on the receptors on the postsynaptic membrane, blocking them up and preventing acetylcholine connecting with the receptor to cause the end plate potentials to discharge the muscle. Let's think about a normal neuromuscular junction. Acetylcholine quanta will be released and these will generate end plate potentials, like so. Because there's always more acetylcholine than is strictly necessary to cause a depolarization from an end plate potential, even if there is some depletion of the quanta, there will always be above threshold value to cause the muscle fiber to contract. In a disease state, such as myasthenia gravis, even though acetylcholine is being produced, it's not sufficiently activating the blocked up acetylcholine receptors. If that's the threshold value here. As acetylcholine depletes from the primary store, it will start to fall below threshold level. As it falls below threshold level, there's a blockage of conduction between acetylcholine being released and the muscle fiber being able to contract. If we perform this over hundreds of muscle fibers, we will actually start to see a number of muscle fibers dropping out each time. So if we're measuring the compound muscle action potential, which looks like that, and do so repetitively, we will start to see that the amplitudes start falling down. Of course, secondary stores start mobilizing, usually by about the fourth or the fifth repetitive stimulation, and start flooding the area with increased acetylcholine. And so we see a little bit of uptailing as there is some recovery. If we further exercise the muscle, there'll be increased depletion of acetylcholine stores. This means fewer quanta of acetylcholine being able to excite the muscle membrane. Hence, there is a steeper decline in the muscle action potentials. So I'm now going to show you some repetitive stimulation on my APB muscle in my hand. So that's the muscle that lifts the thumb upwards like so. And I'm just going to place the 
bar electrode here at my wrist. First thing I'm going to do is make sure I deliver supramaximal stimulation. And you can see on the display that I have now reached supramaximal stimulation. I'm then going to run a train of these, so that's going to be at 3 hertz or 3 times a second, 10 of these discharges. And here we go. And you can see on the screen that each sequential CMAP motor response is appropriate, it's the same amplitude, it's not decrementing, it's not incrementing, i.e. it's not getting smaller, it's not getting bigger, it's staying about the same. I then exercise the muscle for 20 seconds. After I've done my 20 seconds, I'm just going to run the test again. Now some people do run the exercise for longer periods of time. And over here you can see that the motor amplitudes have actually increased a little bit. Not massively, but a little bit, and this is a normal finding following exercise. Uh, and it's certainly not decremented, and it's certainly not doubled in size, and that's the kind of thing that we can sometimes see with Lambert-Eaton myasthenic uh, syndrome. We can also look at individual muscle fibre function using single fibre EMG. Imagine this is the terminal axon, and it's innovating a number of muscle fibres within its motor unit. We are able, using a very fine needle electrode, to pick up individual muscle fibre activities. Originally, this was described by Eric Stahlberg as a medical student, and he used a very special needle electrode which had physical properties which allowed it to isolate activity from literally just two motor fibres. These days we use a variation of this using a concentric needle electrode and modern filtering techniques to achieve a near similar result, although it's not entirely the same. So what we do in this scenario is we introduce the needle into the muscle and we are trying to isolate activities from literally one or two muscle fibres. The first thing we do is we lock on to, let's say, muscle fibre number one. And as that's contracting, it produces a action potential. We then move the needle around until we locate fibre number two whilst we're still having fibre number one on our oscilloscope. And this can appear on there like so. Each of these has got its own neuromuscular junction. And so there's some inherent instability at both this junction here and in this junction over here. In health, if we were to overlap all of these responses in time, we would be able to see only minimal amounts of jitter. And this means a little bit of movement or jiggle, some might call it, of the actual muscle fibre potentials, like so. And we can measure this. In the disease state, we might find that there is increased variability of acetylcholine transmission to the end plate potential. Hence, we will find that at one point it will occur over here, another point over here, another point over here. And this is called increased jitter. If the jitter is sufficiently large, we can actually start to see blocking. And if we were to draw lots of these, but instead of superimposing them, we were to, let's say, draw them one under each other like so, sometimes they may not actually transmit at all, such as in this one over here. I should note that there is some debate as to how we term our modern method of performing single fibre EMG 
as to whether we can truly call it single fiber EMG or apparent single fiber EMG, as we can't be absolutely certain that we're only picking up potentials from a single muscle fiber over here. We might actually be picking up from a couple. However, that debate is a little beyond the purposes of this explanatory video. I'm now going to show you a recording of single fiber EMG on my EDC muscle in my forearm and that just picks up the fingers. First thing I'm doing is I'm hunting for a stable unit and then I'm going to lock onto that and look at other pairs coming in the same time relationship with it. Over here on the screen you can see that this unit is paired to the triggered one. can actually analyze this. And the jitter here is 21 microseconds with an MCD of 21 microseconds. And that's very healthy and very normal. You can see that there. 